Uh, today we're going to be doing a little bit different uh, transitioning. We went from Joseph and now we're going back to Jesus, but we're following the United Methodist lectionary. Miss Lena, if you'd like to come on up. I've got the scripture here for you. Oh, good luck reading this. <laughs> you got your own Bible? You can use this one. Oh, man, oh, man. I'm colorblind and I, I highlight all this stuff in colors. And... <laughs> all right, so we're going to read 4, 1 through 13. So all the way right up to there. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where the forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on my walk. The devil led him up to the had a place and showed him in the east of all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all the, their authority and splendor that has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will, be, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the only Lord, worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. And the devil led him to Jerusalem. And had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from him. The Lord is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your heart against the stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord and your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him to them. Opportune time. God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ms. Lena. <laughs> it does take courage to come up behind the podium. It takes courage to come up behind the pulpit. And we, I don't know if, if you noticed this, we, you were more confident this time than you were the first time, and you're getting better every time. Public speaking is difficult. If you do it a couple of times, you're natural. <laughs> you're natural. <laughs> Amen to that. Some of the best public speakers, some of the best musicians started in the church because they're surrounded by people they love and encourage them and help them. And, I can't tell you the first couple times I got behind the pulpit, I couldn't get words to come out of my mouth. I was so nervous and shaking, I had to hold on to it because I was <laughs> quivering behind it. People couldn't see it. Uh, so, yes, if it's all right, we're going to say a quick prayer, and then we're going to open up the Gospel of Luke. Oh, I got a joke for you first, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> you follow me around all day? <laughs> the other churches. All right, well, there's a taxi cab driver that sees a guy that needs a ride, so he pulls over to pick him up, and the passenger hops in the back seat. He says, sir, I'd like to go a couple blocks down to the right. He starts off driving down the highway there, and, and pretty soon they notice that they're going to miss the turn. He's coming up, he's coming up, and he can't get the driver's attention, so the passenger goes to tap him on the shoulder. He says, hey, we need to turn right here. Well, after he gets tapped on the shoulder, the taxi driver loses control. He's not okay. He flies into the other lane. He misses an oncoming car by just a little bit and slams on his brake right before he hits a building. He says, don't you ever touch me like that again. I was scared. You frightened me. The passenger says, oh, I didn't mean to scare you that much. I didn't know you'd overreact like that. I won't do it again. The taxi cab driver turns and says, no, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's my first day driving a taxi. The last 25 years, I drove a hearse. <laughs> I, don't, I suppose that would be kind of that'd be a hard transition. <laughs> Anyways, all right. So let's pray over the word real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so blessed to open up Your Word, Your Truth, Lord. Help it inspire us, shape us, mold us, Lord, that we can be transformed into a disciple that You called us to be. Help us grow in wisdom and understanding, and use what You're calling us to use. And then we pray. Amen. All right, so I love this passage, and every time I, I learn something about the Bible that's really, really neat, I gotta share it. I gotta share it. And this week in particular, I did not know that it's a correlation with Old Testament scriptures. I knew Jesus got tempted in the wilderness. We all know the story where Jesus is out in the desert, he's in the wilderness, and then he's approached by Satan who tries to trick him three different times. It's so cool because Jesus is connecting two different events here. He's bringing other things that have happened previously into perspective. And he's able to overcome things that nobody's been able to overcome thus far. We go all the way back to the book of Genesis, in the chapter 3, when Adam and Eve were in the, the garden. 
we know this one, you're like, oh, Carter, you should have known that, but I didn't connect the two before. Adam and Eve were in the garden, that's the last time Satan physically tempted someone. Satan came up and physically tried and pulled them away from what God wanted them to do. And they were not able to overcome that temptation. Hey, we need you to take a bite of this apple. God said, you know, you're not supposed to do it, but it will bring wisdom beyond your, your years. You'll, you'll get a different perspective that's better for you. They fell into that temptation. They fell into it. This is the very next time we get to see that. But also, but also, Jesus is going back all the way to the Israelite history. If you remember the Israelites, they were under Egyptian oppression. They were slaves and captives to that, the Egyptians there. And for them to be liberated out of Egypt, we know they were crossing the Red Sea, and immediately they went into the wilderness for 40 years. They traveled for 40 years, and while they were in the wilderness trying to get to the Promised Land, they faced obstacles. They had to face adversity, temptations that drew them away from where God needed them to be. Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days, preparing himself for his ministry, is an example of the Israelites traveling for 40 years, preparing themselves for the Promised Land. And they did not pass the test. They would have went right to the Promised Land had they passed the test. If you remember the journey, they actually got right outside the Promised Land, messed up, made a mistake, and had to turn around, and they traveled for another couple of years. So, Jesus shows us here that the gap between his glory and our unfailing ability to, to stay in line with God's word, there's a difference between us and God. He's bigger, he's better, he's got power to him, and he passes tests that nobody has passed this far. He comes, not only does he prepare himself for his ministry, but he shows that he's different, that he's special. And we'll see that a little bit here. So Jesus here, if we're going to go to the first verse, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. So we're backtracking here. The United Methodist lectionary this year, he gets baptized, but then we get to see some of his miracles, then we get to see him do some things like feed the hungry, some of his teachings. Now we're going to see him start, just like we're starting Lent, our 40 days, Jesus is starting his 40 days. So he was filled with the Holy Spirit. If you remember when he was baptized in the Jordan River, a light from the heavens was open. Down came a spirit like a dove into his heart, and God, a voice from the heavens said, This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. I have called him. I'm going to use him. He's going to do something special. Just like he calls you and I, I'm going to use you. You're my beloved son, my beloved daughter. My spirit is in your hearts. You're called for something good. So he was filled with the Holy Spirit. After Jesus went out of the water of the Jordan, he immediately went into the wilderness. Just like if you think of the uh, Egyptian people that were chasing the Israelites, out, the, out of the water that they passed through, out of the Red Sea that they passed through, they went in the wilderness. You see how those two line up almost identically? It's crazy. <laughs> so he was filled with the Holy Spirit. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we know where our source of strength comes from. We know where we can lean on every morning. When things look broken, when we don't know what to do in life, but we're leaning on the Lord and we trust that that's enough, it causes us to live in a different way. He leads us and guides us into places that we wouldn't normally think of or go to on our own. And just like he is being guided by the Holy Spirit, the verse here that says he is full of the Holy Spirit doesn't imply that he wasn't full of it before. It just means that he's full of it in an abnormal way. An unusual public way. This Holy Spirit is so on fire in his heart that people are taking notice of it. And he left the Jordan and was led into the wilderness, where for 40 days he would be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them was hungry. Here we get to see something happen here. We get to see something that happened with Jesus, but it happens in our daily lives all the time. If you think about the goodness and glory of God, Sometimes we have to also be reminded that there's another opposing force out there that tries to strip us away of our joy, of our peace. Something that tries to, to belittle us, make us think less of ourselves, pull us off the path where God needs to be. And it seems like every time in Scripture that there's a blessing from God, you see that there's a temptation that almost immediately follows. There's a repercussion. God blesses us, but then there's a hardship, a trial, adversity. How we handle that? It really determines where we go in our life. It determines how we're used by God sometimes, because if we stray away, you know, we're not going to where God needs us to be. So here we get to see that opposing force. We get to see something happen. And every time I think of the scripture, I always think of Jesus, and I think of the devil, you know, that red horn guy sitting there, and they're kind of duking it out. And, and if you think like that, you're doing the scripture an injustice. You're doing it, you're doing it almost a, a, a sham, because that's not anything what happens here. 
Jesus was fully God, we know that, so we often think that he doesn't have the temptations that we, we do. He's not influenced in the way that we are. But if you think about it, go back to the book of Hebrews here, and it talks a, a little bit about that. Well, in the book of Hebrews, it says, doo -doo -doo. Oh, yep, there it is. It says, doo -doo -doo. For we have a high priest who is unable to emphasize, who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we have. I mean, he's God already gone before. He's experienced what we do down here on earth, but he's greater than it. He never caved. He never adjusted. So anyways, the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to come and be bread. You know, you're hungry, you fasted, you're weak, but if you are the Son of God, turn this rock into some bread. Suffice for yourself. Make your own provisions. Find a way for yourself. That word if, you can translate it, uh, get geeky, geeky back, you probably didn't even know. It doesn't mean if, like he's doubting who Jesus is, but it means the word since. Since you are the Son of God, you shouldn't be hungry. Since you are the Son of God, you shouldn't be feeling like this. You shouldn't be weak right now. Go and provide for yourself. God wouldn't allow you to be weak on your own. Make a way for yourself. We're still tempted in that same way all the time. If you are a Christian, if you believe that God's up there watching over you, then why are you going through what you are right now? Why don't you feel great? Why are you doubting yourself, struggling with things that you shouldn't struggle with? Go and make a way for yourself. God's not paying attention. He's not there. He's not going to provide. We're tempted in that same way all the time. And it's a real temptation. It draws us away from trusting on the Lord, thinking that he doesn't have us exactly where he needs to be. Sometimes we doubt that we're supposed to grow where we're planted. He's saying, go make a way for yourself. And when we do that, oftentimes we get away from God's path that he has in store for us. Make a way for yourself. That's the first temptation he says there. This is what I absolutely love about Jesus. Because he doesn't combat all these temptations with something that we don't have. He doesn't use a supernatural sword. He doesn't battle Satan with something that we aren't capable of having. He uses the Word. He uses the Bible. He's, he quotes Scripture here. And in fact, the Scripture that he's quoting is from those same Israelites who we just got done talking about in Deuteronomy. This is what Jesus says here. It says, man does not live on bread alone. Man does not live on bread alone, but he lives on what comes from the mouth of the Lord. God says that in Deuteronomy. He's quoting scripture here. When we are faced with hardship, with temptation, something trying to pull us away, make us feel less than we are, and it's real easy for us, we can know with full strength in our heart that we are equipped to handle it just like Jesus did. Grow in wisdom of the word. When hardships pop up, when things try and pull us away, we are equipped when we have scripture in our hearts and our minds. So anyways, he doesn't fall for that. Then we know the second one here. It says, uh, Jesus answered, The devil led him up to a high place and showed him an instant of all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. You know, some people like to say this is a vision, that, that Satan gave him a vision of all the kingdoms, the providences, the power. You can have money, you can have fame, you can have all this stuff in the world, influence, and I'll give it to you. Satan right here is saying, you don't need to do all the hard work to the cross. You don't need to go into Bethlehem. You don't need to go into Jerusalem. You don't need to die on that cross in the most excruciating way. But instead, I'll give you a cop out here. I'll give it to you. All the things that you're here for, I'll give you all the kingdoms. You can have an easy way out. That's another temptation we are faced with all the time. Why do, the, do things the right way? Why go above and beyond? Why bless the Lord and glorify Him with the best of your abilities when you can just take the easy way out? Settle for less. Do bare minimum. Just get by. Don't ever just get by. Don't strive for the easy way out. God's going to use you to the fullest extent. He's put you where you are in the circumstances that you're at because you can strive and grow and change the lives around you. You can be used as a tool for God's ministry in incredible ways when we give Him everything we have, our best efforts. Raise the bar. Don't let yourself talk yourself into, I need to take the easy way out. All right, that's the second one there. The third one, this is the last one, and it says, uh, verse 9, the devil led him into Jerusalem and stand on the highest point in the temple. This is where he says, since you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he goes back to this, this psalm here, Psalm 91, he says, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up from their hands, and they will lift you oh, so that you will not strive your foot, strike your foot against a stone. Words. 
He's, this is what, what he's doing here. He's challenging them. There's an old prophecy. They genuinely believe this, that when the Savior shows up, when the Messiah shows up, he will stand on top of the temple and his glory will be revealed. They all thought this would happen. And they're waiting for it to happen. He says, look, if you want them to know who you are, then let's do it in a really, really big, incredible way. Go up to that temple, and there's a corner of the temple out there that stands way above this Kidron Valley. It's super high. You can see it from every place. Everybody will see Jesus, and everyone will be able to see him jump off and not be struck against a stone. And he, Satan uses scripture there to inspire this temptation. You know, sometimes scripture out of context can be taken and manipulated. You can say just about anything you want in the Bible if you pull it out of its context. And Jesus knows that. He says, while that scripture is correct, that's not what it's intended for. That scripture is intended for taking a step of faith. If you take a step in faith, knowing that this is where God is guiding you and leading you, then he's going to bring you to where you're supposed to be, but you're not supposed to put God to the test. Don't put God to the test is what they're saying here. And he quotes that from Deuteronomy again. All three of these he quotes from Deuteronomy. God said it before. Jesus is saying it again. <laughs> He says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. I love that. I love that. So anyways, before I let you go, I'm kind of talking, going over time. I heard about the snapping turtle. Uh, kind of dorky, but I thought it was cool. It's 250 pounds, the largest alligator freshwater turtle. 250 pounds. And yeah. how it gets its food, because yeah, yeah. it goes for, for meat, it eats primarily fish. It'll lay in the bottom of a river or the bottom of a lake and be completely still, motionless. It opens its mouth up real, real big. And when it's just sitting there laying on the floor of a river or a, a lake, it wags its tongue around because it looks like a little worm. It's got this little uh, appendage to it that makes it look like a worm. So all these fish that are swimming around looking for worms, trying to provide for themselves, they see its tongue wagging around. And because it's so still, they go right into its mouth, bite its tongue, the snapping turtle closes its mouth, and get, that's how it gets bit. In that same way, that's exactly what Satan tries to do to us today. The negative forces in our life, when things are going well, he baits our hooks with something that's enticing for us. He gives us legitimate means, he tries to fulfill legitimate needs and desires for us in illegitimate ways. He tries to make things the easy way out, things look enticing, but they're actually bad for us. And we can rest assured in 1 Corinthians here, it says this verse, I love this verse. Uh, it says, He will not lead you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. Meaning that we have a God who's never going to let us get into a situation that's going to overcome us. We might bend and bend and bend, but it's never going to let us break. We have a God who gives us strength that nothing else can. He says, but when you are tempted, he will provide you a way out. Temptation strays us away from God because when we are following God's plan for us, we're becoming more equipped in the church every single day. We're growing in strength. We're finding true joy. We're getting closer where God wants us to be, and it's really inspirational. If you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and you've followed His words and His path, it changes us, but it also changes others. These opposing forces try and strip that away. Just be, be careful this Lenten season. The, the reason why I think this is brought up in the lectionary is because as we are striving to be better, as we're trying to improve in areas in our life that need to be addressed, oftentimes when we try to make these improvements, we are tempted in ways that cause us to fall. Understand that we have a God who lifts us up, calls us his beloved son, and gives us the source of true joy, strength, and power. So, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, it is a blessing to dive into your scripture. It's a blessing that we get to learn from Jesus in this experience that he had in the wilderness. Lord, as we are facing temptations and going through trials of our own, Lord, equip us to know that you have called us to overcome, that you are leading us to somewhere better. Help us stand up and not be overcome by these temptations. In your name we pray. Amen.